So, welcome back to the second part of my lecture. Uh, here's about more uh, integrated and how to use memories and non especially non-volatile memories in products and in, in the real world, I would say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This one. So starting with an SRAM bit cells. I tried to compare here different approaches, so it depends also how, uh, as I said before, it's a layered optimization um, and you need to squeeze out as much as possible in terms of trying to to squeeze down the bit cells. The more you squeeze down one bit cells, the larger you can uh, to the building blocks. So this is a standard way of a ton of uh, six transistor bit cell. Here we have two bit cells, so the upper one and the lower one, just to show you that typically you build it in a way that you just can mirror and then you have two bits. So what you see here is always uh, the red ones are metal lines, the yellow ones typically the polys. Uh, the purple one is a deep anvil, so here you have the PMOS transistors in this range. Here you have the NMOS transistors in this range. And with this standard approach, you have certain design rules, so to each contact you have a certain distance to the next metal line. So you cannot squeeze this closer together, you would violate some distance rules. And also on this side you have distance rules. What you can try to do is here to share some contacts, for example, here if you go up to metal 2, this is not shown anymore, you can share one contact to this bit and to this bit, so at least you can squeeze down a little bit the size. But that's more or less it. So with such an approach, typically you have around uh, in point here, we're talking about 0.80 nanometer, uh, you have around 6.3 mic square micrometer per bit cell. Um, what you can do, and that's what the fabs typically do, is they they look into the real aspect of how this is really uh, in the lithography really done in the final, let's say, mask. And typically you will not get rectangular shapes. You always have light, so you you edge it down. There will always be some bending and some uh, oh, change in the in the shapes. So what you can do then is, let's say, for example, here you can you do not use just rectangular uh, just x and y to route. You can use also some angles for your metal connection. Also at the end, you build such called hammerheads. You see, this is close to the contact, what would be here, but in reality, this will be etched away. Just build it in. Uh, to do that is because then you have a really a clear round shape. If you don't do this, it will be under etched at the contact. So therefore you always have to extend a little bit, but you do it in a small way that this, the lithography will take its place then and, and optimize it for you. So you can see here, you more or less squeezed together everything and we gained 25%. So this is really a, a nice tweak. And sometimes you end up in, let's say, sensitive parts. And therefore, as uh, mentioned in one of the slides before, the FAB can also optimize the memory, memory bits. For example, if a typical transistor distance would be in a certain way, typically you have some implants and always using equipment with different angles. You can rotate it in a certain way that the etching here uh, can be taken advantage of and then you can squeeze down much more. So then you have kind of additional optimized RAM bit cell. So that's what the FABs do. And for example, here's another FAB, they even put it down further. So you really see even this contact, they made some additional small cuts here, really to squeeze it down and they gained another 10%. So here really it's between six, uh, 6.3 square micrometer to close to four square micrometer is quite significant because this is, you can build in 50% more bit cells in the same area on the top level. So it's quite nice. But nevertheless, whatever you squeeze out here, if you would go to the next process node from 110 down to 130, you would gain automatically factor two because of the smaller transistors, because of your minimum uh, poly width and metal width is 
is down to the new process, not smaller. Uh, it's it's more narrow, so you're allowed to squeeze down systematically. That's what the smaller process not do. And if you just compare such a pizza, here we're talking about a few square micrometer. For example, 40 nanometer, we're talking about a quarter of a square micrometer per pizza. So, O25. So here, this change, what you have, you could build in 10 bits in SRAM just for your saving area. So, and this is more or less SRAMs are the driving force for process nodes in general. You want to bring in more memory. At the end of the day, your process is limiting your maximum memory size. And then you squeeze down the process and go to smaller nodes. And of course, the digital part, which is needed to, to uh, connect it then. So, yeah, I said before, um, here's more or less the same. This was the pizza, and here are some configurations what we have seen before. Let's say address decoder, uh, address decoder, data IO buffer uh, for some smallest compiler. Uh, here is also distinguished between register file and SRAM. You see this sometimes uh, if you can order from foundries, register files. Register file is the same like an SRAM. It's the same pizza, but the configuration is different. Typically in an SRAM, you always say, okay, you always want to build a compiler which is able to address whatever half a megabit or even more. So you need a certain amount of addresses. And they really built in in the address decoder all the address combinations which are possible, even if you just use four bits. You have to you cannot get rid of the of the remaining NAND NOR gates. They will be zero and not used and not uh, selected, but they are there. So it's a lot of overhead. And therefore, there's this register file is just dealing with, a, let's say, reduced number. You cannot build in. You can just build here maximum 72 kilobit, but the, uh, you, the saving is in the, in the .io. Definitely, you can see here, even on the color the difference. And this is what, if you know that you will not need more, you will go with this compiler. If you want to get up to larger configurations, you use this one. Um, this is a different fab, different POSNOT. This was the one which is uh, with coming with the smallest bit cell. Then you have a, another foundry, which is also has a, a optimized bit cell, a little bit different build, so no mirror in the middle. But you see it's left right so they wasted here some kind of area so it's kind of um, if you want to integrate this in the digital you always need rectangular shapes otherwise the tool cannot handle or you have to split it in certain rectangular areas and sometimes you have the disadvantage that you waste some area or just put in your filler cells you could optimize it better so it's you see it's not even that the bit cell is larger also, the configuration is much larger, so you end up with the same number of bits. For uh, I was always used the example for 500 for one kilobyte. You see, more or less from 0.06 to 0.13 is double the size with more or less a similar bit cell. And here we decided to set this butterfly system where you can mirror and, and reuse some address and, and data IO decoder. For this, we did some example also using a non-optimized bit cell, you could come down to an even optimized area smaller than this one, which has a much better bit cell, a smaller bit cell. But here you gain the rest of, in this part, this is the overhead part, you optimize it. So there are a lot of ways to optimize this. And this, this is why you see if you optimize, uh, try to get a memory for a certain process node, you always will find synopsis, you will find ARM doing some RAM ROM compiler, high power optimized, low power optimized, speed optimized. So they always try to look into different compiler and you can get different ranges. And this is the nice thing, it always depends on what you want to do. So it's also a, a matter of uh, definition what what you need and then you can select between different optimized systems so here's an example also on the scalability what you see here is more or less if you go down to lower number of bits of course the area overhead uh, in the address decoding and and having a unnecessary decoder is changing is separating here but the more you get to larger number of bits the more the let's say 
the one with the optimized bit cell will win, win of course. Then the overhead in the address decoder is not that critical anymore, uh, but the bit cell is then the dominant part. So therefore you see this kind of... And compared, as I said before, compared to different process nodes, 0.35, which is, let's say, a uh, minimum uh, line width is 0.35, or transistor poly width uh, 0.35, and here it's point 0.18. So you see from here to here, you have a factor of four to eight even. So it's really, it was not a really optimized one, but uh, changing the process node from point 0.35 with a certain amount of memory, you can get 10 times the number of bits in the same area. So it's really a huge step, and I said before, uh, maybe next year I should add here as a, down to 40 nanometer, you end, would end up in here. So really small areas. So coming more to a topic which is my favorite because I did it for several years in the company. It was my first in investigations, which I did to more than 20 years ago in AMS. I'm building blocks based on the scene layouts. So these anti-fuse systems. And what you see here is, okay, this is just a building block, you have some registers where you store in some data. Uh, so more or less instead of RAMs, here I don't need RAMs, here you use exactly some flip-flop chains. And then you build in your bit cell, so the transistor plus the, uh, the anti-fuse, which you want to destroy. And you build a high power path. So this path you can consist and has a certain path where you can apply this 100 milliamps direct to the fuses and the rest is to select the correct fuse at a certain time and to the timing. With the clock you can select and bit by bit to a clock and from outside you can have the access. So that's what we did and even the maximum current is 130 milliamps so even more than 100 milliamps. So you have, you have to take care of about corners where you would need uh, higher voltages and higher currents. So how the, the bit cell, so going into the anti-fuse, I said before, it's always a PN junction. And typically, the easiest PN junction you can get is an anti-fusion and a P-diffusion. This is the area where you typically define an NMOS and the PMOS transistor. So we don't want to build a transistor here. So we use this anti-fusion, which normally is to connect uh, the NMOS transistor, uh, low ohmic, and the P-diffusion, and overlap this. So this means... You have some overlap, so you, let's say, you have a kind of um, area where you have n doped and p doped, so it's it's more or less a neutral area, and then uh, this means you need to have a certain voltage to apply a certain current through it, and on the other way around, if you go on the other way, it's typical p, so from this side p n diode, but uh, the area uh, with with the reverse voltage you build in here. Uh, uh, let's say, yeah, this this zone and, and define the breakdown voltages. So what you can play around with this one here, so for this is a typical one, you see we built in here two parallel anti-fuses. It's not only one, it's two. And uh, the main reason for this is, here we're talking about really being at the edge of the process node. So. We want to reduce the overlap as much as as much as possible to to have to create a really low overlap. But if you take into account that this has some processing steps and there could be a variation from this mask to this mask, then this could be on the one side be smaller or more or less overlap. Uh, so you try to compensate this by having two in parallel. So there's always one. Zener diode, if you have two in parallel, if you shift this anti-fusion into this one here, then this is the strong one, and this will be destroyed, or the other one. So you always have two. This is for reason of reproducibility. And uh, having such a Zener diode, what you see is here, also you can play around with the distance. So to optimize it, what we built in here is, even if you go to a positive distance, means that there's a distance between P and NTIF, you typically have the P substrate here, so the P diff is more or less just the connection to the P substrate, and this is building also diode, so you can uh, create then the standard diode, which has a high uh, reverse breakdown voltage. And if you come closer to that, there is a certain point the overlap is not dominant anymore. So 
if there's an overlap, you have this voltage breakdown uh, reduced to a certain voltage, so from 10 volts down to 2.5-3 volts. Uh, and then the more or less overlap is just area, what you waste. So therefore, you can optimize this element and just take care that you have an overlap of 0.2. What we have here is the optimum, because here you have also some, let's say, flexibility in terms of, of uh, misalignment. And to show you what can happen in a production is, this would be the typical 0.2 micrometer overlap. Then on this side, you just stretch the fuse that in this side, the variation doesn't matter that much. So if you have now a misalignment in terms of um, of uh, uh, lithography, sometimes you can more or less edge, so it will be uh, reducing this area. You see then the overlap is 0 0.1, but we've seen before 0 0.1 is still sufficient enough. So as you can take the, the uh, production and, and the edging part is kind of covered. Then on the other side, misalignment of N-diffusion versus P-diffusion. As said before, you have more overlap here. So this is, of course, this is then, this will never break down, but then you have a good diode here. So you will use this one. And also in this direction, the misalignment by using here 0.4 micrometer, you still will have an overlap, even if you have this uh, bad misalignment. And if you drift a little bit in the one direction, then it's even better, going better more in this direction. So that's what what you need to take care if you build such a diode. So you always have to optimize. And what you do then is create a matrix of a lot of different variation. Try to run this through FAB, see a FAB variation, force in the FAB variation some uh, effects and doping and change the procedure to see what could be the minimum maximum to see if you still can program this element sufficient. And yeah. Even here, if you would have a shrink in total, so by another etching, you will still have 0 0.1 micrometer. And we've seen before that even 0 0.1 micrometer, it's getting up then, but it's mm, still would be able to program. Okay, so uh, having, let's say, some characteristics on this. So typically, I did here a logarithmic current. What you have here is this Sino diode. So in the if you increase the voltage, uh, your current goes up. So at a certain point you have the 0 0.3, 4, 5, 4, uh, 4, 5 volts, which is enough to increase the current up to milliamps then. And once it is starting programming, it's melting down, then of course the resistor is lowered and then the current is quite high. So you more or less have a stable timing and from external two three microseconds you can bring in some energy and destroy this one and then this will come back like a more or less a serial resistor only so pn junction is destroyed so we'll have in logarithmic of course it's not linear anymore but in reality it's a serial resistor uh, of the melted fuse uh, melted thinner diode so and what you can do here is apply a certain current of 50 microamp then you may need to build in a comparator so this is the burnt signal diode uh, by uh, variation of this what you see here is due to different current different temperature a lifetime drift has to be considered and the quality of the burn process and what you need to take care is then to say okay you need to build in a comparator which is built in as let's say 1.2 1.3 volt and has a certain range so you need to ensure that your minimum programmed voltage is not exceeding 500, 600, 700 millivolts, something like that. So you need to ensure that in programming condition, you have to screen out everything which is too close to the comparator because then the comparator cannot really say oh, it's a one or zero and maybe in a different, on a, a different temperature is then changing from one to zero. And on the other side, the burned ones, you always have, this is what, what is given by the process and by the conditions to ensure that you exceed a certain uh, current, uh, a certain voltage by applying a current. So here we are applying a current and, and measure the voltage back. So what we have here is, for example, this is a different, just a different view on that. We have, let's say, um, more or less put in here 
uh, the Synodite voltage uh, after programming. So we are entering this area and we want to ensure that after programming it must not exceed a certain level. And this is then, of course, uh, this variation. What you see here is each of this is one point. So you can get typically from 100 millivolts up to 1.2 volts. So what we did here intentionally is we used really weak burning conditions also to see, okay, for some reason, sometimes you don't have enough energy. You need to know what happens even with this one. So this would be screened. So in production, whenever you do an analog measurement on this, you would eliminate this die and you have to ensure that you end up in this area here. Uh, and on this special characteristic you see this is a timing information what you see here. So this is a uh, the voltage direct after programming. So and if this would not change over time you would have everything on this diagonal. Means programming 500 millivolts over time would stay at 500 millivolts. And what you see is that they are drifting towards higher voltages to pitch, typically not down. So you need to have some margin here. So means if you go back to this characteristic, therefore you need a certain gap because you need to take into account over lifetime, the 700 millivolt here will be 900 millivolt maybe over time. And this still has to be considered as a zero. So therefore you do this screening. And this was just for us to get some statistics to say, okay, what is the probability having some drifts more than, and this is a six sigma drift, so really having a lot of bits programmed and this one will be eliminated. And we, if we limit it to a certain voltage, a programming voltage, then you end up typically in this red area here. Okay, so coming from the Synodiode, we were looking for, let's say, reducing the current. It's quite much current and also, let's say, the comparator range or resistance change is not that dramatically, so we're always sensitive on the comparator. So we were looking into uh, polyfuse and what we've seen at the beginning in, in the over, overview, we're using now a uh, polyfuse. This is this line, this small line which you melt up. And typically in such a comparator, you always compare a resistor of a polyfuse with a reference resistor. So this is more or less building a comparator. So you say, okay, this is unprogrammed 50 ohms, 100 ohms, something like that. Programmed, it can be mega ohms or at least a few kilo ohms. So you build in this resistor as close as possible to the unprogrammed ones. So typically... To avoid much current, you use around two, three, one, two, three kilo ohms, and ensure that this one goes up to 10 kilo ohms or even more after programming. And then you can easily see that, okay, we have left, uh, if you have the different resistor, then there's a de delta voltage here, and this delta voltage is then applied by some switches into this, and this is a RAM. So it's more or less just. Uh, switched on the left part more than the, this one and then you build in a RAM, uh, build it asymmetric and once and, and if you remove then the read link then you have a digital information stored. So from volatile to non-volatile for this purpose but this means also this reading current you can switch off. So then it's stored permanently, not permanently but uh, as long as you have supply you're stored in your ledge more or less in this flip and this in this easy RAM pixel and it's in there. So all in all the whole circuitry is nothing left than a RAM pixel with a recharge content. And you can define later on with programming one fuse if it is starting up default as a high or a low. And a typically a standard RAM, if you start up a standard RAM it's totally random. So you really have to put in a reset signal and write zero ins for a standard RAM to clean it up. And here you would have a pre-content which you can define. That's the nice thing about this. Yeah, I don't, I think the circuitry, how it works. Uh, there are some typical, I think I found this in a, in a paper or in a patent. Uh, I said before, this voltage will be applied here and the different switches are used to transfer the delta voltage into the RAM. And uh, what we did then to say, okay, we 
use this and wanted to even to improve this area. So here you have, oh, sorry, you have two parts, the left part and then the right part and additional switches. So you have to match also distances with this one and this with this one. So additional complications in the circuitry. So we decided, okay, why not using this element directly more or less in the RAM? So if you have a RAM left and right and one side is, let's say, blown up, then this side will be, uh, the threshold will go down and then more or less it's, it's just one inverter active and then it's always high. And if this is connected, then you just uh, need to build in, let's say, asymmetric RAM bit cell that in startup more or less this is zero. So that's what you can do here. Typically, you still need to apply a certain current left and right to get a delta voltage. Then you build an asymmetric RAM and at a certain point it's locked. So you can, uh, you can disconnect and the supply uh, or the, the, the trigger data line and it's locked then. So it's load. So the load changes from uh, charge from low to high. And as I said before, we have the switches active. You pull down both lines and then release it. And then this delta voltage is kicking off the RAM asymmetrically and it's stored. Oh, okay. I don't want to go too much into detail here. Um, what was said before, the OTP resistance. Uh, could be a problem with that here. Yeah. So, because typically in the test floor, if you want to have a RAM, the idea would be okay, it's pre charged, but later on, maybe we will change it. So, for test cases, sometimes you want to override this, even if this element is programmed. You want to say, okay, I want to clean or clear it and go back to zero. Uh, the disadvantage of this circuit is if this is too high ohmic giga ohm, so that you never can come back because you this is really a, this part is not working anymore it's not supplied and then you always have a one this is somehow bad the test engineer was complaining about this we said okay this is a feature because if it is programmed you should not move it back because it makes no sense you cannot change content once it is programmed so um but at the end of the day we had to find the solution also to be uh, to use this and one one disadvantage of all the circuitries is if you have a slightly small voltage difference, even if you have a slightly small, um, a large resistor change on that, we are talking about a few kilo ohms. So to get a certain few hundred millivolts difference, which is sufficient to drive this, you would need at least a, a, a high current to each branches to get to this delta voltage. So we're talking about here a few uh, milliamps programming. This is always consuming power at the read part. And what you need to do is then also mismatch is taking into account. So you need to apply a certain current, wait until everything is stable because you have parasitic cups, so you have to wait. And then you have a delta voltage and then you can uh, uh, log in. And by Changing the concept to say, okay, I, get, I want to get rid, I want to get used of this capacitance, what I have here. So I, I use this resistor here, this polyfuse resistor, and built in, let's say, a parasitic cap on the other side. So this is anyhow given, this is my programming transistor, which I need to switch on. But this is also a parasitic cap. And once if I switch on this supply here, I need to charge this parasitic cup. And typically you wait until this is charged and then you have a delta voltage. So you have to wait. And uh, the nice thing about these cups is in the charge phase, you have a huge gap or a huge difference in the loading, in the charging of these lines between this node and this node. Because here you have the reference, one kilo ohm. Here you have either, let's say 50 ohms. So this node is much faster charged than this one. So if you stop during charging and say, okay, now I want to select in the middle of the charging, instead of waiting that all nodes are settled and then applying a certain voltage difference, you can get rid of this delta. And that's what you see here. Either it's the the red one is always my, I guess it's the, uh, ref, yeah, it's, it's the, the left side, the ref is my reference, has a certain charging time. The left one, either it's unprogrammed, 
so it's a zero, then it's charging much fast because you have 50 ohm just so. 50 ohm in serial to cup, charging much faster than if you have a mega ohm. If you have a mega ohm, this takes ages. And if you say, okay, if I'm in the middle of this time and get a certain delta voltage between this and this node, I just lock the RAM. So I get this information when the delta is the maximum, either one or zero, and then switch and, and then put in a feedback loop in, in the RAM and lock it in. And this is done in a nanosecond. So this is quite fast, taking advantage of the charging, which I need to have no additional current. So this is a nice approach. We did it, and now this is in most of our circuits used. And this was some invention we did 10 years ago, even more. Okay, building out of this, coming to the larger, so with this bit cell, what you do is then build in bytes, so 8 bit of this in a, in a row, and then several bytes, data I.O. It's more or less the same, like you see on the RAM. So you try to build a matrix, and then some digital logic which can control this. And that's a nice thing about this. It's scalable, so later on you can change. You don't need the compiler. We didn't never did the compiler because just you are somehow limited in the area, and we defined that 16 byte is sufficient. And the overhead is not that much, so if you exceed 16 byte, then you just copy the block a second time. Okay, uh, a little bit about the burning procedure. What happens during burning? So this means this is more or less coming back to the previous circuitry. You have here a switch, which you need to switch on. So here you need the power switch for the whole power. Then you have the resistor and then you have the burn transistor. So this is inherent in this circuitry also implemented because if you want to program, you need this path. So, and uh, this is more or less the same what you have here. This is the switch of the BIMOS, then you have the polyfuse and then your NMOS transistor and some kind of logic where you can switch on for a certain time. So uh, you need to have a stable program polyfuse. So you need to define the time with this clock, you need to define the current. This is more or less the transistor defining. So you build in a transistor which is optimized to allow you with a certain supply voltage, uh, a certain current. So you have some control on the VDD to this current more or less. So of course you can change if you increase the supply, you automatically increase the maximum current to this branch. And on the other side, you can have a, another voltage which is the voltage where also the current is coming from. So some stabilizing circuits uh, where you get some power on short uh, distance to the pad for the current to have a fast peak and not having some serial resistors here. So you have these parameters, this VDD, this VDD, the current is more or less dependent on this VDD and then the time. So these are the parameters which you can have. So the burn voltage we call it, then the burning time and then the current, which is also driven by the VDT. So these are the parameters, and that's what we do here. So this, more or less, uh, for a dedicated VDD, we try to verify what is the difference if we change the voltage, uh, which is uh, responsible also for the main current. So what you see here is, if you are below a certain voltage, 2.4, 2.6, let's say less than three volts, you can apply a current, but the melting process will stop somewhere and uh, will change from, let's say, 100 ohms resistor, could change at one kilo ohm, 10 kilo ohm. So this is nothing which you can use. So it can be programmed, it will not, it's not 100% sure, sometimes it's not programmed. So the higher the voltage, of course, you see the more, less probability that it's unprogrammed. And after, at a certain voltage, you see all of them are really even in the mega ohm range. So this is your minimum voltage you would like to have. But of course, unfortunately, there are some process changes, process, uh, um, let's say, corners. So you have to go up a little bit more. So you have to find the optimum here. Uh, and you have to avoid to come back to this region. Why is this region? This is if you exceed the current too much, then you're in the opposite range. Then you destroy something around the polyfuse. You always have to focus the 
energy into the fuse if you destroy something around it's also bad then then this is creating lifetime reliability problems and this is what you try to do to build in a, a voltage range so you have a certain you need plus minus 100 to millivolts of course there's never an ideal source uh, and then also your comparator levels what you see here we built in a two kilo ohm and then you ensure that you are with the comparator within this range and this is a different type of characteristics to show the same effect you see here it's the same also the voltage going up and this is more or less the same what you see here but here you just see okay a lot of lot of measurement points you do not see okay how much points do we have here or how much points it's just thousands of bits so it's spread out so therefore we do it in this way to say okay if i have one million bits and if i have a voltage of 2.4 volts more or less one million bits are unprogrammed and after a certain exceeding a certain limit ah, okay you see almost 10 percent of these are programmed so only 100 but still 100,000 are unprogrammed so this nice thing about this is is coming down by 100 millivolt by more or less a decade so if you reach a certain voltage like 3.2 3.3 volt you end up in a few ppm so what you have is uh, a failure rate which cannot be burned maybe just out of one million one cannot be burned you will never reach a better thing like it's always physical limitations of the burning process you have some weaknesses in the path or some uh, let's say some limitations on the resistor or whatever so uh, this is the best you can get and then after that it's going up so you see even at that point you destroy a lot so almost uh, only 10% are programmed uh, each each tenth bit is not really programmed anymore so this is what we get here and of course what you see here the, we did a lot of variations so corner lots different variations on the resistor and so on so you get a bunch of uh, parallel paths but always with the same steep here or with a parallel uh, yeah with the same characteristic so you can build in and say okay on this one i try to find the optimum window in between here and still enough margin also to this area where I can get some troubles. So here for this process node we found 3.3 to 3.5 volts for example as the optimum. Interesting thing just as a note for you, if you exceed this path it will go down again. So what happens then is that you really get the really quick shot destroy the fuse that fast that it's really cracked open and you cannot destroy anything outside but the disadvantage is you need really high voltages and even here sometimes you get some bad programmed ones because this quick shot could be open just a few nanometer and over time this could regrow but there's other let's say other vendors using this path here and have programming voltage really up to four or five volts to be able to program but we don't so we use this optimum okay so what we see here we defined the different classes so this is underburned so it's just yield loss this we call overburned this means it's yield loss it's not that bad if it is yield loss you can just eliminate so you will not ship this to the field but the problematic point is if it is lifetime changing. If you ship it to the field, it's intended to be a high and then it becomes a low over time. And this a customer, if he's using a security feature to switch on and off something, some feature, he will see it. So this should be avoided. And therefore, we have to control the mechanism for this programming quite good. Okay, um, same like shown before on the Synodiode. We have the resistor direct after programming and then over lifetime. You see it's also increasing here. So we can have more or less over time a stable element. The nice thing about this is an anti-fuse, if it is increasing, you always goes towards the comparator. So it's getting worse over time. Uh, the fuse is if it's increasing to higher voltages and the unprogrammed is on the low level, it's always getting better over time. So most probably you will not get any troubles over time with this one and this is the nasty thing about the overburned ones they even will go down over time 
So they could regrow and come down from what you have a few mega ohms, could come down to a few kilo ohms or even a few ohms so that they really get uh, physically zero again. And this you can, this you absolutely have to avoid. So I just made here some snaps. What we always do is really find the boundaries. So you really try to use all voltages, all combinations and see where's the limit of the whole process to find windows. Um, and now the nice, uh, let's say the interesting thing, but I think we're quite uh, almost over time, but um, here's some polyfuse, I've, you've seen this before, but now we're going into the detail, into the physical aspects. So typically this fuse, this is the part which you want to melt up and somehow you have to connect it. So the more contacts you have, the better, of course, on the other side. Uh, you can you have a certain distance to this so if you place more contacts here they will not help you this is also adding serial resistors so if you need 20 milliamps any additional contact here will give you one percent more current maybe but not more just wasted area so this is more or less the optimum you can get sometimes you can bend around here and maybe try to put here two contacts but more or less we found the easiest way to connect it like this is always the best way to avoid problems. So, and here what we see is on, on the unprogrammed fuse, if uh, we look on to this optical, we see this is, we are talking about uh, 350 um, nanometers, so 0.35 micrometers. So you see also the optical light is somewhere at the edge. So you cannot see much more, but you can see that it's somehow reflecting. So this is called ILDD. So what you typically see here is charges. So there's a, there's a, a filter on top of an electron microscope where you see charges. So you see a lot of, lot of current is coming in here uh, because this is really low ohmic. <coughs> so, so more or less the light is, a, is, is a, a representing a resistor. So the lighter it is, the low ohmic it is. <coughs> so you see here is a resistive path and this is the polyfuse here and then you have the contacts um, if you look on the SEM so on the SEM you exactly see what I mentioned before you will never get these rectangles in reality if you do the processing it will look like this that's because of all the elements you use for processing are always a bit of light so you have interference and you will never get these sharp edges like you want to have here so uh, and if you do even here a cross section and look from the side, it's uh, somehow what you can see is really this shape. So this poly is not only a poly, it consists of two sh sheet element. So you have this poly, it's a polysilicon. <coughs> it's nothing less than uh, silicon, but in small grains. So you always have ideal silicon, but somehow not uh, in, in, a, in a crystalline form. So just uh, non-crystalline and has a certain resistance, which is quite high ohmic. And to overcome, to get this to low ohmic, because on a transistor you want to connect low ohmic, you deposit this with tungsten. So you, you put in here some um, tungsten silicide uh, and deposit it with a certain small sheet. And you see it here. And this is in, in this um, cross section, you see this lighter because it's low ohmic also. It's the same procedure or the same principle like this one. The more low ohmic, uh, the more low ohmic it is, the, the lighter it is. And you see the poly sheet resistor is quite high ohmic. So this is what you, what you built in here. So this is the same cross section. And if you do a, <laughs> the, the final Im implementation on that, what all the final analysis you can do is a TEM. So you build really, you cut it down, uh, then put in a 50 nanometer thin film, and then you can shine through. And then it's inverting the light. So the low ohmic is dark and the high ohmic is light. So this is just for the reference. Oh. And the reason why I show this is because here are how the fuses are burnt then. So you have seen before that this fuse, from this point of view, you don't see a change. It looks more or less like it was before. So with optical, you cannot see. Was it programmed? Not, I don't know. Here you can see, okay, there's no low ohmic path anymore. So it has to be high ohmic, more or less, at least a few kilo ohms. 
what you see on the SEM is, okay, this was somehow melted up. It's not connected anymore, and there is some gap here. And if you do cross-section, you see even this was blown up. And on the TEM lamella, which I have zoomed in here, you see really this shade was this light and the dark one, tungsten silicide, this was this double sheet, was melted up and recrystallized in a high ohmic way. So this is stable over time. You cannot regrow this element. This will stay as is. So this is really good, even if, if it is connected or not. You don't care, this one is high ohmic. So this is how it should be after programming. Um, so ideally programmed. If you do too much programming, you can even see in the optical microscope, ah, oh, something has happened here. Some damage is what I mentioned before. If you exceed a certain voltage, you will damage something. You see, okay, it's still programmed. So fuse seems to be okay, but uh, from an electrical point of view, outside it's low ohmic. <coughs> So, and then you see, aha, uh -huh, okay, this fuse was melted up, but in a slightly different one. So here not, here it's melted up and a little bit different. And if you look at the cross section, you see, ah, uh, it was melted up, but it goes in a totally different direction. So here you have the aluminum metal one and not the down the contact, the polyline. And the programming path is melting up the whole area and finds a different path for the material to connect. So you get some aluminum out of this, you see, reduced aluminum, and making parallel shortcuts to the fuse, which is then creating the troubles of a lifetime. And with having a lot of statistics, we did it several times, weak programmed or over programmed to see, and you see a lot of different shapes, but ending at the same principal problem. Could be good, but could be critical of a lifetime also. If you do underburning, so too low current, you see ah, the fuse, the resistors should, doesn't change. You don't see anything. Here you see, aha, okay, a little bit, this is a little bit more high ohmic than this one, but more or less doesn't change that much. And here you don't see anything. And on the cross sections you see, if you zoom in, okay, some parts have been melted up. But then this cobalt silica, uh, this poly tungsten silicide on top is still somewhere around. So it's still low ohmic. So, but here a little bit high ohmic because there's a serial change. Good thing is over time this will regrow a little bit. So they will go up. So once it is programmed, still will not harm uh, over lifetime and go to lower voltages. So even this at least is a positive thing. But of course, sometimes it's unprogrammed and you can throw away. Okay, so having here some current characteristics, what we see here is the resistance on the voltage model is the same characteristic what we've seen before with a lot of uh, dots, just picking out a few dots uh, of this. If we're in the optimum programmed range, we have some bits in, uh, in the mega -ohm range. So even if this one was, let's say, 200, 300k before, it's not becoming one mega ohm over time. So the green one is zero time and the red one is over time. So even this one, as shown before, is going up. So these are the underburned ones I've seen before. Uh, here we have the melted ones and these are the overburned. And on the overburned, it really depends that you see some of them stay high ohmic, but some of them go low ohmic. And this is what we get here. And if we, another parameter, of course you can check everything. What you can do is to see if you switch on the programming path, then you have a certain characteristic in the current. Of course you need this 20 milliamps, or in this process not 35.35, it's even up to 35, 40 milliamps. So the yellow one is the underburn, so you see, okay, it's limiting by 25 milliamps. The green one is the optimum, so you see, uh, okay, 30, 35 milliamps is optimum and it's stable over time and I can define from outside the current and stop it. And the red one, it's melting up, but then it seems to be uh, strange. The current is going down, but then finds another path, goes up again and that's it. And then you end up with such kind. So theoretically, if you would have the ability to check each fuse during programming this dynamic current, 
you could immediately see if this is good or bad program. But unfortunately, this needs an oscilloscope and you cannot do this in mass production. But let's say at least we can uh, understand much better the physical effects. And here just some some nice things which have been which what can go wrong in real production which you haven't seen before and you get back from the field sometimes irregular burn fuses nobody has an idea this haven't we haven't seen this before this is somehow looks like semi burned with low currents but on the other side it looks here good burned also this one and it turned out the problem on this system was it was burnt a thousand times. So they did a repeatable test, so they put it in, uh, burned it unintentionally. They didn't know that they were burning it with really low voltages. And the reason for that was that the power on the reset in the system was triggering at 1.8 volt. So they were always using, a, let's say, the fuse was unintentionally selected, a current was flowing, until the supply reached 1.8 volt, the power on reset was resetting and it was stopped. And this was done in a in a test phase where you repeated this thousands and thousands of times. And this was starting regrowing bit by bit the fuses and then starting also destroying the tungsten here. And this was a fuse which was, uh, let's say, changed the resistor from by itself from zero to one and then later on back to zero. So it was really interesting to analyze and identify the root cause. So it was really the power and reset circuit and the degradation of tungsten suicide. When we did the cross sections, we could see. Yes. So it was nice to identify whatever else can happen. Okay. So coming to the last part and I think I will speed up a little bit. We're over time. Um, it's embedded EEPROM, and here it's more or less just a few slides to give an overview. I think we could generate a dedicated talk on that for several hours. So as said at the beginning, you have always a double poly system. So you can do it poly and poly. You can build it like this with uh, different shapes so they can use this on the one side as a, as a switching transistor and the same as a coupling or you have such kind of systems. What we are using in one of our technologies is this kind of poly that you have your floating poly and then build in a second poly which is surrounding here. And this is building a one, two, three transistor system. And the nice thing about this is that uh, it's quite small and it's more as a BMOS instead of an NMOS transistor using this. So typically you have NMOS based uh, flashes and the reliability is much better than everything which we have here because it's encapsulated and light insensitive because it's covered by another poly which is shielding it from light and also from other radiation. So having a cross section in this one, as this was a technology which we which we uh, in, uh, implemented in our fab in point thirty five. This poly, the small poly what you see here and this oxide on the poly in reality is more or less, this is the small oxide, this is the poly. Uh, <laughs> so you really have this small, so, so this is the first poly, this is the oxide underneath the poly and then you have a small oxide between these two polys. And this is more or less the poly one which we had before on the polyfuse also. So you have this poly and then you have the tungsten silicide, so more or less this part is the full poly and just this is oxide distinguishing between this transfer gate and the uh, and and the floating gate. So you just need to tunnel through this oxide. You need to apply a certain voltage. And what you see here is, as I said before, you might as have uh, such a kind of three transistor systems system, and they can be used as switching on and off the cells, also in the read operation mode. So. Uh, how to program an arrays. Of course, you need to, you want to get electrons inside to store energy. Nice thing about this is you tunnel, you do a tunneling. So you apply here a really high voltage up to uh, using charge pumps up to 13, 14 volts. And then the electrons are really tunneling through this oxide. So they, they use a, a special effect. Uh, in the physics, it's this tunneling effect as a fold or no time tunneling. 
and so it means programming current is in the range of a few microsecond and uh, microamps only. So it's nice. You don't need a lot of. So you need a charge pump, but you do not need power. Yeah. So charge pump, just a few microamps, you can easily generate. And if you pull down the well into the negative, you you LM, uh, you can pull out the electrons. So you can charge and discharge. And what you do here is, as mentioned at the beginning, you just you have your threshold barrier, and then you shift it up and down. So it's more or less this. What you can see here with the different approaches. I don't want to go into detail here. And of course, some circuitry really looks like similar what we had before. So you have a current mirror here, you have a differential pair, and then a switch to activate or deactivate this. And then you have the uh, path where you have your fuse or the, your EEPROM, and then you have a reference path. Instead of resistors, you use currents here to compare. It's a sense amplifier which you can use. And then you digitize it digitally and put it in the flip-flops and store it somewhere else. And the memory of this is really consisting of the different parts which we learned before. So the memory plane where you have all the optimized bits. So you, here you want to really optimize the area. This is if the bits, uh, if, if the memory size is growing, this is the dominant area. So yeah, we use a memory where you can see all the contributions. So it's the X decoder, we call it here X decoder and Y decoder. And the Y decoder has some multiplexers here. So you have some page register. The page register is used to, to speed up. Typically you need for each byte, if you want to program, you need a few milliseconds. So you need a kind of RAM implemented here, where you store here in one kilobit or something like that. Because as I said before, a few microamps only, or even yeah, microamps for many parallel bits, you can program a whole plane in parallel down here. So with four or five programming cycles, you fill the whole content. So here you can pipe in and fast program it. And then test interface, this is additional switches. You have also a, a control logic and then you have the charge pump, so a high power path, a high voltage path, which, which is needed. Several registers or several stages for the charge pump. And zooming in, you see here the bit cells coming down to the one which we have seen before, this coil. And this is really dense, so you really get used to it, you mirror it really too be able to squeeze it down to the memo. And here's an overview on what kind of applications are used for that. This is really using a 8-bit only. So this was really a, more or less just a digital potentiometer where you wanted to trim 8 bits, but you wanted to override this. You cannot use OTP, you want to reprogram this and it has to be stable over time. So this was a power meter, so you just needed a few hundred bytes. So you see here, the, also the bit cell is not dominant, it's more as the, the, the digital part. Then a different shape of an EEPROM for RFID. Another one, RFID, so just increased in one direction. So another one, and then uh, as a kind of configuration of a flash, I just want to mention that the difference between the EEPROM configuration and the flash is, in the EEPROM, you build in uh, the system in a way that you can erase byte by byte. So you can program and erase, and you can program and erase. In a flash, you configure it in a way that you, you, have, you can erase the whole plane at, at the same time. Gives you some speed up if you want to change content. Disadvantages, of course, if you just want to change one byte, you have to store this in a RAM, uh, erase everything, and reapply the whole programming. So, flash is always coming in parallel with some uh, mirror uh, memories, RAMs. And then, this was the largest what we did in this process. Not you really see the dominant area, and for this, the optimized bit cell takes the advantage. Yeah, and then this was some characteristics what we did. So what you have to do a qualification of them to verify that they are stable over lifetime and program this. What you see here is more or less a threshold difference programmed, uh, unprogrammed and programmed. 
And typically over lifetime or over cycles, the gap is going smaller and smaller. And you have to survive a certain limit. So here you can see we defined it as a few time programmable limit. Typically in the industry, you use 1000 cycles. So after 1000 cycles, so you can build in or you can have even, let's say, worse bit cells which go up like here, you still survive. If you want to have high uh, quality MTPs or TPs uh, or flash uh, yeah, memories, you have to build in like this and here the MTP limit is 100, keep 100,000 cycles and with this memory we could even survive one, me one million cycles which is really high quality so and some data retention relations I don't want to go into detail this is more or less a little bit background of uh, what temperatures if you do a qualification at 150 degree for 10 year you could apply or calculate this back by Arrhenius uh, formula with activation energy to different years. So typically what you need to do to ensure that your memory will not lose data content over 10 years, you need to increase the temperature and then you get and get this. And so there's techniques to identify what activation energy has to be used then for calculation and then you can calculate this back. And just one note about what I mentioned before. I think as we are optical company, this is important that it's light insensitive for this bit cell. It's covered. And what we did in addition, programming arrays. Didn't we have this already? Sorry for that. Ah, um, yeah. This is more or less a different approach. The same bit cell, but using a a metal cup so in a zero mask approach and you can exactly see here the pizza looks much different because you need to have a lot of copper cast uh, copper capacitance so you built in here your uh, where's the pizza selected device you built in here with the metal connection huge parasitic cups and this is increasing the pizza of course and some uh, EPROM gate oxide quality stuff. What you, as mentioned before, you have this oxide where you store all the electrons on it. And there's always oxide around, but it's always leaky. So you can, your electrons can disappear to the substrate, can disappear on a so called sidewall spacer, or let's say to the side. Uh, therefore, you have some barriers here. And then the oxide to the metal is also the weak oxide. So therefore, what you have to do is in the processing step to apply here a much better quality oxide to avoid that you lose the electrons. So that's what you see here, this RPO oxide. You more or less try to encapsulate the body like a shield to avoid leaking current here. The only thing you cannot avoid is, is the oxide tunneling through this one, but this is more or less a really good oxide because it's used for transistors and this should be really low leakage. That's more or less this. Then some characteristics of of uh, programming currents, what we typically do, you have a lot of devices, you apply a certain programming and current, then you over after lifetime storage, you see this was good programmed, uh, this is the distribution of the unprogrammed ones, this is the distribution of the programmed ones. So after applying a certain lifetime, this will go down and this will go up. And the point to this is unprogrammed, they have a, they, they are somewhere in a range of 35 microamps. So you have a differential system and then you, you try to build a large gap. And over time, they're coming together. And then after a certain cycle and time, you have to measure and define what is the maximum distance. You can ensure that it's still working correct. And this is then your maximum endurance cycle, cycles and the maximum lifetime, which you can apply for such a memory. And this is a different show. I think I made some characteristics to show you. Um, typically with a different color, this is time that all the, it's more or less the same. What we had here, this distribution, and then this is going down. And more or less, you can see it the same here. It's from this going also down towards 
comparator and this is the uh, the margin you have between so this is what what we did here is the delta okay sorry forgot that it's the delta between each individual bits from here and here you always have a differential system one bit programmed one unprogrammed and the delta current and the delta current must not uh, must always exceed a certain limit of delta has to be 50 micrograms here so you see over time some of the bits are coming close to the 50 microns, but still after 3000 hours time it's still sufficient enough and the different this is more or less the same but just in time here that you see okay it's coming down more or less stable and after a certain time it's degradating much faster than as well as the time information yeah and this one i think is and Embedded EEPROM cytospacer technology. This is a talk which Tomaso already gave. I don't want to go into detail with that. So if you're interested, there's a there should be a video, one hour video on that. So that's I think the end.